I borrowed from Nick's theme, right? And my quote, my little thing, over the top networking. This is actually a perfect segue from everything that, that you have described, Nick, and your perspective on things. And <clears throat> and there is, a, and this is a game changer. Okay, this what's happened and what's about to happen. And while we're talking about the internet, there are different flavors of internet. And of course, there's the consumer and the commodity internet, consumer internet, which is becoming wireless everywhere. It's passing through us. I was saying that it's totally, it's always connected to us. And then there are advanced versions of networking. Um, so this is about the development application of an advanced network. Um, and just like the the original internet that Al Gore didn't invent, right? Um, uh, it has gone. It, it's built upon that basis, that foundation. And it has advanced characteristics. Now something uh, amazing is happening, and has been happening, uh, and that's the creation of advanced networks. And many of you are familiar with something called Internet 2. And Internet 2 has been around in concept for at least six years, maybe longer. Uh, and just as Internet 1 was created by universities, vendors, um, government investment. Internet 2 was to be the next level of internet communication. Uh, and of course, a lot of lessons have been learned about the original internet. So Internet 2 was created, and there's a very robust Internet 2 network backbone, you might say, that transverses the, uh, this country and the world in many cases. Uh, and many of the this slide's probably out of order, but many of the uh, applications of Internet 2 have been recognized and are being used in different parts of this country in different ways. Um, you know, its characteristics is extreme speed uh, and extreme reliability. Uh, and because it's not congested at this point, because of a huge amount of bandwidth available, it's very reliable. Uh, and obviously, if you're running something extremely fast data rates, you can do things a lot faster. So what, what does that really mean? Uh, and in Pennsylvania, I'm going to go ahead and slide here. Right, and then I'll go back. This, I know it's hard to see, but that's, that's basically the backbone of Internet 2 that loops around the country. And I believe, and there are some Internet 2 experts in the room, uh, and I believe, um, John, that the, the current speed of Internet 2 backbone is capable of what uh, speed? The whole network is up to 100 gigabit backbone. Uh, they're starting to convert it to a terabyte backbone. Okay. Wow. That's a lot of data, fast. Right. Um, and of course, it's linked to other similar networks in different countries. So there's been a lot of experimentation. There's been a lot of maturing of the products. What do you do with all that bandwidth? How do you distribute it? How do you manage it? Uh, that's been going on for five or six years, uh, particularly and one of his biggest applications now is in telemedicine, for example. All these extremely high resolution images and even 3D motion images now um, are running you know, on that network at times. So it's a very powerful network. So that's great. Um, now Pennsylvania, uh, unlike 30 other stations, or states, 30 other states, had no way to really distribute that Internet 2 capability throughout their state, a state. Uh, other states have backbone networks so they're called middle networks, to take that connection capability by fiber uh, and distribute it throughout the state to connection nodes where it can be interfaced to users at different levels depending on their need and their ability to, to purchase the last mile basically to get a lot of data fast or to send a lot of data fast. 
Now, fortunately, uh, there was a group that was, and of course there are commercial providers that provide this type of bandwidth uh, in many areas, but they tend to concentrate in the commercially viable regions, the cities, basically. So they're not about to build a high capacity network to Erie, Pennsylvania, for example. There's just not enough business there for them. Um, so what's begun to happen, what has happened, particularly in the case of Pennsylvania, uh, and particularly since, if you remember the president, uh, at least three years ago, maybe it's four now, as part of the economic development of the country, was very much behind um, broadband networking, making it universally available throughout the country as an economic stimulus. So he directed funding that was made available, stimulus funding, remember that, uh, to a, an organization called NTIA that received applications from country from states and other organizations that wish to uh, build out that capacity, so it would be universally available to stimulate business, jobs, you know, all that. Um, a group was put together in Pennsylvania, and a nonprofit was formed. That's why I'm backing up now. Uh, the group that was formed ended up being uh, named Kimber. And that's the Keystone Initiative for Network-Based Education and Research. I got that right, Pete? I did it. <laughs> uh, and their first project, right, as a nonprofit. So they were the non 501c3 nonprofit organization that made an application to build a project called PenRent. Pennsylvania Regional, no, wait, Pennsylvania Research and Education Network. That's the physical network, which is a project of Kimber. Uh, and they received, they were fortunate in receiving the grant for close to about $100 million, uh, which was a matching grant. I don't know, total project was about 140 or so, 150, 128 million to physically build a fiber network throughout Pennsylvania uh, to make that type of service available universally uh, and to tie it into the, you know, the National Internet 2 capability. So I think, it, so it is a nonprofit coalition, Kimber, uh, with innovative partners the commercial providers are not members of Kimber, but they are supporting members of Kimber. They help support the initiative. As a matter of fact, due to um, regulatory requirements, the physical network, which is 48 strands running down the, the pole, the poles, uh, I think 50% of that must be made available to commercial, for commercial use so that there's equal access even though the network itself is operated by a nonprofit. Internet 2 is a nonprofit, okay? With vendor support, of course, vendors get a lot out of these things because they help develop the technology, they do tests, all kinds of benefits, and they benefit with their future products and their other commercial products. And if their products are good, they sell them back to others who just say that's the best product to use. Um, but the Internet 2 and Kimber are member organizations. Uh, and the board of directors can decide on what the membership fees are. The board of directors and the staff, obviously, and the director of Kimber must establish, uh, obviously, they must keep the network managed. That's subcontracted out to one of the large network managers. Uh, and obviously, they have to raise the revenue to keep the whole thing whole. Um, but they, by having this structure, it means that to other non-commercial organizations or non-commercial entities, such as education, uh, medicine, you know, all the nonprofits basically, including all the way to libraries, if we get to that point, um, they can establish rates that are greatly reduced from commercial connectivity rates for such capacity. And that can stimulate a lot of things. Now, fortunately, public media statewide is a member of the board. We were part of the group that formed Kimber. Um, 
and that goes back to the Hergy, I guess the Hergy, the uh, the history of uh, that Walt referred to when the Pennsylvania public television stations were all interconnected through and originally a microwave network. It goes back 30 plus years, 35 years. So there's always been a collaborative spirit among that group for different purposes back then. But um, so that group felt that, well, this is an interesting new model now because it's, it's the third party commercial network provider is not really at the table the way they used to be. Uh, so, of course, it offers all kinds of broadband digital resources and access to all the worldwide networks at this extremely high data rate. Uh, and just a little bit about PenRen, you can say, well, what's this, have to, what's this have to do with broadcasting and public media, in my case, and, and other broadcasters, but particularly public media, which is a non-commercial non organization. Um, PenRen, which is the physical network, uh, is being <coughs> built now. The estimate right now is to be 100% complete in June, this June. Um, I guess 70 or 80% of it is up and running now. Depends on how you count the bits and how many packets are running into each other or not, you know. Um, uh, and there will be 70 plus access points to the network throughout the state in different forms at different rates. The initial network service, obviously because of the multi-strain capability, uh, it's not envisioned that all the strands, even 50% of the strands would be used uh, directly by all the members, particularly with the way technology keeps changing and you can add more and more uh, spectrums of light onto a fiber to get more capacity from the same fiber. But so there's dark fiber, keep it, so there's dark fiber service. If someone needed dark fiber, dedicated dark fiber from point to point, uh, one, 10, 30 gigabit per second ethernet and point to point. When you get up to 10, 30 gigabits, and that's really where it's launching, right? What, what does that mean, all that data, right? You can see where experimental things and things they do at universities can easily well, good, we can play now, right? We can play with giant images and we can do multi-screen, high-definition uh, video conferencing displays, things like that, you know, that's, you ever seen Internet 2 demos? It's amazing, one of the most amazing one that was here, Internet 2 recently met here, was a synchronous playback of two musicians uh, on stage. One was in Michigan, was it, I think, John? Uh, to Cabo, Illinois. Cabo, Illinois, and on stage, at the Sheraton or wherever we were, playing synchronously as if they were on the stage together. You think about the latency and the, how can you possibly do that? Because the throughput is so fast and so great that it's as if they were perfectly synchronized uh, over a network. Uh, so there's various levels and of course experimentally because the backbone can go to 100 gigs, all kinds, so that is really a future look and a today's look at where advanced networking is sitting. And we already saw that one. Now in Pennsylvania, this is the network configuration for the Penren network. That's the physical network that Kimber is completing. And you can see it's uh, gotta get untangled if I'm gonna go over there. So this is uh, basically Penn State in the middle, right? And uh, Penn State has been obviously one of the major developers of the concept. They have an extensive network between their universities and other campuses. Um, and it's, bas it's two rings. It goes all the way up to the Erie area, out to Pittsburgh. I don't know what this is down here. You know what that is, Pete? It's a mountain, <laughs> but it's a ring here and a ring on the eastern side of the state, All right? Going back up north, up toward Wilkes-Barre, Scranton, Lehigh County University, Pocono. Poconos, yeah, up in there. 
uh, and then it comes down through Lehigh Valley and you know through the backbone and comes into the Philadelphia region this whole region here north um, northeast region uh, and its point of presence in Philadelphia is 401 North Broad Street and that's a main communication hub for this region for internet too and this internet this new fiber network why somebody say why because somebody got lucky and bought that piece of property <laughs> I think it everybody had to be there it's, it's right near the um, uh, the Amtrak lines and that's where a lot of the uh, large capacity fiber was run down the Amtrak lines a long time ago In there, they, they have a zillion communication lines and backup generators. Oh, yeah. It, it's a fortified site, as you might imagine. You know, There are other data centers in the region, but that seems to be the primary. And almost all the carriers and all the communication companies have sections of the building, cages. And they you know, run cable and cat five and above fiber between the cages. And the landlord collects money every time they run a new fiber cable between the cages. <laughs> and of course, this network is built with the highest quality, best state-of-the-art mature equipment for this purpose. So it's, this is the optical layer interface unit, which is called an ad for FSB 3000, right? Uh, and it's configurable different kinds of wave modulation up here, different modules to interface with fiber. And more depends on how many strands. Uh, this gets you connected to the data on the fiber and the various technologies that run over light. Uh, and it, the current one that's being installed, I guess, uh, is capable of 100 gigabits per second. I, I guess that means per channel or per, per fiber for fiber channel, yeah. Uh, and then, okay, well, what do you do with this? Then once you get it in your hands, that's where you get to carrier class equipment made by Juniper, um, which I think uh, obviously breaks that down as a switching and routing platform to the various uh, end users in different flavors, one gig, 20 ports of this, 20 ports of that, 10 gig, whatever you need, however you configure the modules. Uh, but this, this, these kinds of technologies are very high-end, state-of-the-art technology. And I think, if I recall, that switch is in the area of fifty to $60,000. Is that right? Close to it, yeah. Just for the switch, right. And then, of course, that's sort of the connection node for the local user, right, to, to go to another network that already exists or not. Um, now, in WHYY's case, we're, because of our interconnect, we're already connected to 401 through uh, fiber, fiber. So that is, and actually we have set up through a interface, a, a, a service, an ISP service provider and service center, a uh, a connection to the Kimber network uh, and this group called Magpie, which is a Philadelphia-based um, ISP and other service provider, uh, is also the connection node for Internet 2 for the region. Right? There's another connection <coughs> node in Pittsburgh, so it's possible to connect out there to Internet 2 services that may be available to bring into Pennsylvania or share all kinds of things between locations in Pennsylvania. <coughs> it's pretty cool. Now, that's the good news. The bad news is if you're not connected at a common node connection point, then you may have to build connectivity from here to there. So that's the last mile. So unless you're a heavy user, it starts to become cost prohibited to build the last mile the cost to use the bandwidth is extremely low to actually use the bandwidth for members on that network. All right, so let's get down to a little more 
granular level, I guess, is uh, so what are public media applications to this, for this? Uh, obviously, it becomes a high-speed access to core business functions. All the things that are possible with cloud services and more are now candidates to be connected because a lot of the people that provide cloud services on the Internet are also building cloud services on Internet 2 where they can be much faster and remember, our connectivity cost to get to them is much lower than it ever had been in the past. Uh, so about content, it's also a great platform to move high quality content because of the bandwidth <coughs> and the speed. So certainly the idea of a content exchange or con public media content uh, library, if you will, even from that perspective, um, is very realistic. And if it's something that can be searched and we can, any public media station can retrieve content very quickly, uh, it changes the whole paragon, right? To get a high, you know, to get a 23 gig video file across other type of connectivity, uh, you know, take over a night. But with these speeds, once you build to a reasonable speed, it can be done in, you know, less than a minute or something like that. So it changes the whole idea of do you need mass storage locally? Okay, because certainly mass storage is a cloud service. It kind of started on the regular internet with the box and Dropbox, and now they're expanding, and there are other service providers, and it might even be another nonprofit like a university that says, we want to provide a um, storage service, a, a commodity storage service using the fiber network. And here's our rate. But now it means that we don't have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to build our own storage systems and all the support costs. It's a collaborative, we're paying for a portion of it. So it's, it's a way for us to get to a cloud type service that works for high quality content. It's never existed before, just not practical. Um, of course, there's always the, um, the ability to collaborate once again with the other PBTN, that was Pennsylvania Public Tele Television Network, to do joint productions, to share information, to shoot stories. So one section is shot in Pittsburgh, another in Philadelphia. And unlike the past where it would be kind of shipped to a location to be edited together into a documentary or something, uh, through these networks it can be dynamically edited as you're producing it. Because you can do virtual editing now through these networks. So that you can actually have work prints and you can work on a piece and it's part of the piece. You know, So it's great efficiencies. And that could be centralized so everybody doesn't have to buy one of these. Uh, the other, uh, of course, there's always national and international special events, which is one of the internet two specialties for PR purposes, I think, too. But the things like the simultaneous orchestras and uh, hologistic uh, three-dimensional projection, all these, they're, they're great because they're development projects. But there's the ability to interconnect anywhere in the world for a low cost with high quality changes the paragon again. It's just not it's just not practical today. And of course that can include interfacing with IP type content producers. It's not limited to that closed environment, particularly in public media's uh, perspective. Uh, multi multi station central cast. Many of you are in broadcast, you know what central cast is. And that's basically originating multiple stations on air programming from a central location instead of everybody building a master <coughs> control. But the technology has gotten, the technology to do that has gotten very inexpensive compared to the old ways five, six, seven years ago. But one of the barriers was the connectivity costs from the commercial providers for that circuit to get it to Pittsburgh or Philadelphia. That's dramatically changed because of the Kimber membership. Now, why not? Let's do that too. We talked about shared resource post-production, and of course of great interest to all the business planners and the general managers is eliminate the duplication in major capex or capital investment in new technology and equipment and all its related costs, right? Which is all this, you know, the skilled services, support contracts, you consolidate it all. Um, the difference is it can be as if it were right here because of that speed of a network in between. 
uh, I guess we talked about broad access to public media content, utilization of other content libraries. That's the Telview library, right? <laughs> but really, there's great interest, and in, I've been going around at Internet 2 presentations and other occasions in the last year, I guess, talking about how we have good things that we want to share, and there's great interest in doing that. It just hasn't been a practical way to do it. Now it's, it's, it's possible. Now, one other, um, one as an example, right, of a um, an example of one application of using this type of a network in content, content management, storage, cataloging, digital preservation, the whole, you know, all that stuff. Most of the ideas are familiar to us. We've had to deal with this in different ways since the beginning. How do we protect the content? Um, and we know it keeps changing, keeps deteriorating. Uh, we have been, WHYY has partnered with uh, USC with a project they call the Digital Supposit a uh, Repository out there where they built this massive system. It's not suppository. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that was the first version. <laughs> Uh, so just to round this out, because we don't want to go too late tonight, I think, if uh, things behave here, I've got just a short video that gives you an overview on what they do, and it's, it's really amazing. The USC Digital Repository is a partnership at USC between the Information Technology Group, the Libraries, and the USC Shoah Foundation Institute. The idea is to leverage the strengths of all three organizations to make USC the premier institution for preserving collections of all sizes and which are of significant research, educational, and cultural value. There are many, many, many archives and collections that exist in all kinds of different formats around the world. And the issue is media rots, media degrades over time. For instance, with film, you get about 50 years before you see age-based damage conservative. Videotape, you can get 20 years. Hard drives, five years. The newer the technology, the faster we're seeing age-based damage or rot. The clients we serve range from the researcher at a university who perhaps has a National Science Foundation grant and needs a large amount of storage space to house their research and data, to the larger commercial entities, such as a movie studio, that has reels and reels of film sitting in a warehouse that needs to be preserved. We provide services from beginning to end, which means we do everything from digitization, cataloging and indexing, preservation, web access, and file server access. We have digitization systems for rare documents, manuscripts, high resolution imagery. We digitize audiovisual material with mass digitization robots. And for quality assurance, we have systems that make sure everything that comes off of a physical piece of material gets into the digital file correctly. The digital repository offers cataloging systems that will allow the attachment of keywords or people's names or latitudes or longitudes or any kind of metadata that's of interest to the archive that's bringing their content to the repository. By attaching keywords that follow various standards like Z39.19, you enable search engines to move through your material very quickly, very accurately, and bring collections of information back to you. The USC Digital Repository Preservation Systems are 40 petabytes in capacity to date. We constantly monitor every digital file. Each file we take a fingerprint of. And if we see any piece of media that has had a one or zero change because it's fingerprint changed, we copy from one of the many other copies onto brand new pieces of media and throw away the piece of media in the file that was damaged. The field of cloud computing requires us to be at the bleeding edge of technology at all times because technology is moving at a very rapid pace. We change our media every three years, both disk and tape, to ensure that the files are always stored on the latest media. The USC Digital Repository can provide information and access information through very high-speed networks that go all over the world. For web access, the Digital Repository offers two systems. One that gives access to the entire asset. It's great for images or documents. The other one is for breaking items down into smaller elements. For instance, with a video file, we can break it down into one minute 
clips. So every file and every minute or every page within those files is able to be accessible by whatever kinds of keywords or topics that somebody wants to be able to search them with. There are multiple file server services that the USC Digital Repository offers. We have a tape-based solution where the data is stored on tape and can be secured for multiple decades. We also have a disk-based solution where we have very high-speed disk and each bit of that data gets replicated off-site. This disk is connected to one of the fastest supercomputers in academia. The data can be manipulated and rapidly transformed into many different formats. The USC Digital Repository has been based off of the work with the Shoah Foundation Institute, which has over 100,000 hours of video, millions of documents, over a million images, and all of these together allowed USC to make sure that the systems that were built for the USC Shoah Foundation Institute would work for anyone's collection. The University of Southern California has a long and established history. It's going to be here for the foreseeable future, and any collection that finds its home at the digital repository will be preserved securely and reliably for many years into the future. One of the unique opportunities that the University of Southern California is able to offer is the ability to have very high-speed networks, systems that are able to catalog all the information, many, many petabytes of data available for use, and a supercomputer to process it all, all in the same place, and accessible and usable by people all around the world. Uh, so that's just one of the potential applications that we're starting to test with them uh, and possibly interface our requests for content to play back on air today or for production directly from their system and have it delivered almost instantaneously uh, without us buying the system and only uh, you know, paying a small portion of the cost to, to maintain that system. They're also geographically diverse, so their entire library, because some people say, well, what, what's going to happen when the West Coast falls off, right? right. Uh, it, they've partnered with two others who basically mirror the entire library in different parts of the country. But it really is entering a completely new age and possibilities for content management, content distribution, and how we create it all. And hopefully uh, more of the dollars that we raise or that are developed or go into the content and less into the, the systems to hold it all and to manage it. Are you looking at contributing to their content as kind of a historical thing of what's going on? Or you're more in just a pool, pool mode right now? No, we're, well, we're, we're looking at building our uh, a, first a WHYY collection on their system, okay? Uh, now you get into rights management right away, okay? It's a question of what purpose was the content created? Can it be released to others? That's sort of like the political level in a way. It's yes. not necessarily the technology level. So we're testing concepts. We're also testing the capability of our current network capacity through Kimber to Internet 2. There are other providers in Pennsylvania like the, uh, what is it, the Pittsburgh Super Data Center, Computer Center. Yeah, and, and this is one of the things that the Kimber membership is doing. We're all getting to know each other. What do we all have? What resources? How can we pull them together and how can we share them with the PenRen network as the foundation of it all? And also what's out there that is very unique that we could import? Nick? Are there bridges between Kimber and Internet 2 and the public commercial Internet or are they completely isolated? And kind of as a follow-up, when, when are these kinds of bandwidths and technologies going to trickle down to you know, the more commercial world? Uh, well, there's a couple questions. Yes, there are bridges between Internet 1 and Internet 2, to, to make it simple, right? As a matter of fact, a lot of the uh, educational content that Magpie creates or plays back for people on the educational network uh, are also available on the Internet. And if it's a two-way video conference, which is using more sophisticated technology because it's HD, there's usually a, uh, a version, at least you can view it and you can email your question in. So, and, but inter I believe Internet 2 and Internet 1 uh, in some ways are the same because the domain name service 
is, is to cross connect, I believe, between the two. I'm not a technical expert with that one, so anything I missed there or should add? John is with Magpie. Um, I mean, Internet 1 and Internet 2, essentially you've got two different types of backbone networks. So the commodity Internet will never meet Internet 2 just because the researchers already gave up their network once. They're not going to oh. do it again. Mm -hmm. um, especially now when, uh, just to give you an example of file size and data transmission, uh, DNA sequencing is being done primarily out of Beijing, China. They ran a test from a center in San Francisco to the DNA center in Beijing with a 1.8 gigabyte file and it took 15 and 30 seconds to transmit. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're just going to keep improving that network yeah. for medical and research and education. Mm -hmm. The benefits may end up going toward the commodity internet, but just due to level of congestion, we may never see that type of thing. Mm -hmm. There are bridges between the two. They're linking yeah. one to the other. Mm -hmm. That's good. Do we, do we answer both of them? Other questions? Thoughts? But I think you can see this reinvents how we do things. It really does. And that's why it is a game changer. And just so that we don't miss it, well, uh, oh, go ahead. Since uh, this whole thing with Google Fiber at gigabit speeds and they're rolling it out of more than Kansas City, are they more or less aiming to have their Google Network 3 or whatever you want to call it, that they can do the same thing and they're just financing, laying in their own network? Or? No, I think they're laying in their own network, I would think. Because the, unless they buy the capacity from someone else that has dark fiber on the poles or something like that, but yeah, they, so they'd have to build it. Each state costs 150 million, they could do the whole country for a billion bucks and yeah. have their own mm -hmm. internet too for themselves then, right? But see, there's a different, there's a business, different business model. With all the, all the consumer networks, you're paying by the drink, right? You really are, you're, the meter's running one way or another, right? With this approach, Here's, here's, here's bandwidth. See what you can do with it. And here's a basic cost to have the ability to do something with all that bandwidth. So the meter doesn't run in the same way. And one of the services that can be delivered through, through Kimber is the commodity internet, right? Uh, but the meter's running because it's coming from a commercial ISP, basically, or depending on the class of service. Do you have a frame of reference for how much Kimber membership costs? It depends. <laughs> no, I, I think it, de it depends on the type of organization and how much capacity you need. You know, I, w w is that the best answer? So, membership in, in Kimber is uh, qualified to be a, a nonprofit. Some sort of 501c3 or, or six. So <clears throat> any nonprofit organization become a, can become a member, and uh, the rates are determined by your participant level of participation. If you just want to be a member and buy services, you can do that. You want to <clears throat> that? That's uh, I think it's currently ten thousand uh, dollars. Ten thousand dollars a year for membership. If you want to participate in uh, on the board of on the board of directors. Organization that manages Kimber, uh, that's a much higher rate and gives you uh, uh, the ability to help influence the direction. Mm -hmm. so and, sort of right. And the, the, the uh, public broadcasting organizations in Pennsylvania uh, collaborated for one membership in order to get started, basically. And then, obviously, as we develop and justify applications that uh, improve performance and financial performance likely those costs will go up but we're you know we're getting value back hopefully several times over uh, so and it's still in its early days right it's really firing up the network meeting the requirements of the grant getting some major players started There's several several universities are already tied into it and 
it's still being introduced, you might say. But it's, uh, it's here, I would say. When you say it's here? Yeah. Pete's the project manager uh, to build the network. So <laughs> he's done a great job uh, through the snowstorms and everything else and the squirrels on the lines and all that. <laughs>